Jordan Peterson's charter right shot down by a court ruling. Will he fight back? Hi, I'm Brian Lilly, political columnist for the Toronto Sun. It was a shock ruling that came out from Ontario Superior Court of Justice on Wednesday morning. A ruling from a three-judge panel said that a decision by the College of Psychologists of Ontario violated Dr. Jordan Peterson's rights, but it was justified in doing so. It's another example of Canada's courts ruling that you have your charter rights only as long as they say you do. It's not like we have our rights in perpetuity, it's if the judges think we can have them. These judges found that the decision, which requires Dr. Peterson to undergo what amounts to social media re-education, falls within a range of possible acceptable outcomes and therefore violating his right to freedom of expression under section 2B of the charter is acceptable. Justice Paul Shabbos, writing the unanimous opinion, stated that the ICRC decision does not prevent Dr. Peterson from expressing himself on issues of interest to him and his audiences. Rather, the decision is focused on concerns over his use of degrading or demeaning language about which he was given advice in 2020. Translation, you have freedom of expression as long as you express yourself in a way that they approve of. The ruling really focused on what Dr. Peterson said on mostly political issues, while also remaining a member of a regulated profession. Here's another quote. Dr. Peterson cannot have it both ways. He cannot speak as a member of a regulated profession without taking responsibility for the risk of harm that flows from him speaking in that trusted capacity. Harm, such as saying that a plus-side model who became the cover model for Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue was beautiful. Here's Peterson's tweet. Sorry, not beautiful. No amount of authoritarian tolerance is going to change that. That's what he said when Yumi Nu became the cover model. At another point, he responded on Twitter to an American activist complaining there were too many people on the planet with the pithy line, you're free to leave at any point. Now, the people offended by these posts or the post questioning police saying they would have removed children from the trucker's convoy, none of them were patients. None of, but none of them were even in Ontario, really, but people made complaints and the College of Psychologists of Ontario said, well, you went too far and you need training on how to speak to people online. Take your re-education training or lose your license. Peterson appealed for judicial review and he was told, your charter rights don't mean much to this court. Dr. Peterson, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to talking to you. So this court ruling, um, you know, from our discussions offline, sounds like it went further than you thought. Um, I'm guessing you're disappointed. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that would be my expectation. Yeah, well, it's a funny kind of disappointment because I'm disappointed more as a citizen of Canada, I would say, than on the personal side of things. And, you know, people might find that difficult to believe, but I'm in a fortunate position in some ways even if the college throws everything it can at me, there's 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 very little they can fundamentally do to disrupt my life. I'm in a privileged position compared to most professionals. And so I'm outside of their purview in many ways, but I'm stunned by the court ruling. You know, it opens up with a declaration of moral virtue, essentially on behalf of Canadian law, a declaration of the fact that we enjoy freedom of speech followed immediately by the proclamation that that can be limited in any way, essentially, that the colleges and the professional organizations see fit. And if that's the case, given that that's also a branch of the government, that combined with the fact that I am absolutely 100% being pursued for political reasons, as, as I can doc document mm. detail and have, I don't think that our constitutional guarantee of free speech in Canada, I don't think it exists. It's certainly not worth the paper it's written on. And this is very bad for Canadians because lawyers, physicians, psychologists, what they have to answer is their professional truth. And if we're in a situation where it's now impossible for professionals to say what they actually believe to be true, then their professions are fundamentally invalidated. And that's especially true for therapists because therapists only have the truth. Now, I, I've been covering court rulings for decades now, 
Supreme Court for 20 odd years. What I find interesting about this one is um, they they admitted that your Section 2 charter right to freedom of expression was, you know, violated by this decision, but then said, but maybe it wasn't, but then went through all the steps that they need to go through as a court to show that it was violated, but that that violation was justified. It's one of the most bizarre court rulings that I've ever read. They're normally quite blunt and they say, yes, this violates uh, the charter under section what have you, but under section one, this is why we feel it's okay. They discounted the idea that your rights were violated, but then went through the entire process. I mean, at some point they, also they were mocking you. Well, they also discounted, they also said that this wasn't a disciplinary action, which is so, com- it's so comical. It's like, well, it's involuntary. It's punitive. It's by the disciplinary committee. But it's not a disciplinary action. It's And, you know, the other thing that's so, it's so surreal, it borders on comical. Every single complaint levied against me is political. Mm-hmm. None of them were levied by clients or anyone who even knew a client, most of them from people outside the country. Two of them because of criticisms I made of Trudeau, who is now recognized by a majority of Canadians as the worst prime minister we've ever had. One targeting his chief of staff, one an Ottawa councillor, one the trans butchery issue, which I am 100% unapologetic about. And then we'll talk about that in a moment. Well, and then my comments about fear mongering, climate change, apocalypse. And and they cited, but but the court decision cited your critique of Sports Illustrated's choice of swimsuit cover model more than once. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You're, You're not allowed to dispute what you find beautiful? I'm not allowed to dispute whether the redefinition of beauty is a instrumental manipulation on the part of radical progressives, right? Which it is clearly 100%, as well as being like a mendacious and greedy corporate maneuver at the same time. Yeah, it's, when, it's really something, Brian. I mean, I, when, I don't, I don't know. When you went mean. public with this back in yeah. January yeah. And, and you and I talked a bunch at the beginning of January, as you said, Here's what the College of Psychologists is trying to do to me. Um, wrote several pieces on it, quoted from both the complaints against you and from you. And you know what I kept hearing, uh, Dr. Peterson, was from doctors, from teachers, from police officers, from various people saying, I am no longer allowed to express myself oh, yeah. freely because of this. So thank you, Dr. Peterson. What do you think this court ruling does for anybody else that is going to be facing similar disciplinary actions? Well, I know I know not only what it's going to do, I know what it's already done. You know, I know a number of brave physicians who in principle would be willing to speak publicly on my behalf who are terrified of repercussions that will descend upon them by their respective uh, professional associations. And none of them virtually None of them have been able to withstand the total threat that the college can bring to bear on their on the likelihood of them continuing their professional enterprise. And so, like I'm I'm in a very unique position, right? Because I have support all around the world. I have the financial resources to fight this, and it's unbelievably expensive. Like it's insanely expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not practicing. If I do lose my license, I have other jurisdictions that have already assured me that they will reinstantiate my license in their dis- in their district immediately. So there's really nothing they can do. Well, you said yourself, you heard from all sorts of regulated professionals that they don't believe that they can speak freely, which means they can't think freely, which means they can't communicate with their clients or patients freely. It's a complete bloody disaster. It's really not good. And, you know, ordinary Canadians might think, well, that doesn't mean that the ordinary person's free speech is trammeled. It's like, look, if they can stop professionals from speaking, they're going to stop you. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. journalists, like, what's with the bloody journalists, you know, in Canada? Because if they had any sense, even if they hated me, and many of them do, they'd think, 
well, you know, restrictions on free speech, that's probably not such a good idea, given that we're journalists, you know, and there are exceptions, you're one of them, and there are exceptions, in, you know, among journalists in Canada, but by and large, especially, you know, the, the more traditional legacy media, especially the state-funded legacy media, they're all in favor of this, which is, yeah, it's, it's I don't know what yeah. to make of it, man. The, the judge that wrote the decision, and it was a unanimous decision, shockingly. I mean, I'm shocked by the decision. I'm shocked that it was unanimous. Um, but the judge that wrote it, Paul Chavez, likes to boast in his um, bios and his interviews before uh, time that in addition to being the long-standing legal counsel for the Toronto Star, oh, uh, he was go. instrumental in helping overturn Canada's abortion laws. And I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, what if the Law Society of Upper Canada, as it was then called, now the Law Society of Ontario, what if they had before Morgan Toller was a court decision, what if they had said, you know what, if you decide that you're going to speak out against Canada's abortion laws, we will sanction you and you will yeah. lose your license. That is effectively what is happening here because you're speaking out mostly political issues. And there's one, we'll talk about the trans issue in a moment, where people will will nitpick and say that's more than just political. But if Paul Shabbos had faced the same thing that he is upholding against you now. He could not have gone to the courts and overturned uh, Canada's abortion laws in Morgenthaler. It, 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 he would have lost his law license if he faced the same issue that you are. Yeah, well, you know, and well, the other thing you can derive from that story is you wouldn't possibly expect a judge with that history to be politically biased. So... I think the courts are I think the courts are pretty much entirely captured. I worked with some lawyers a few years ago on an issue pertaining to the Ontario Law Society and we saw then and I had many lawyers tell me that the courts are so compromised that they no longer go to court presuming that they can tell what the outcome of a case will be based on case law and precedent because it's become so activist that the judge's opinion goes and so that's and we've 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 empowered the judiciary in Canada partly because of legislative cowardice um, immensely in the last thirty years, and Canadians have no idea how complex most, that most system Can is. Most Canadians would think that our our judicial system is not political like the United States, and yet yeah, it completely right. is. Um, people are not appointed as Democrats or Republicans, liberals or conservatives, but there is a philosophy and. It is do nothing that will upset the Laurentian elite bias. And, and yeah, that's yeah. where we're at with this. Uh, are you going to appeal this decision? Yes. Oh, yeah, I'll fight it right to the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah. This is an all out. This is all out battle for me. Okay. I'm going to bring absolutely every single resource I have to bear on fighting this. I will make every single bit of it public. And so I've kept my sword sheathed so far, but... I know that this ruling will embolden the college, and that's fine. I've been as civilized as I could possibly be so far in this dispute. And so the gloves are off as far as I'm concerned. So I'll fight it indefinitely. Okay, so We're already set up to do it. You you know, we, we talked earlier about the fact that you, you, you didn't think the uh, uh, plus size model for Sports Illustrated was beautiful. You told somebody who was complaining that there's too many people in the world. I thought it was a very pithy uh, response. You said, you're free to leave any time. Um, you know, comments about Justin Trudeau, about yeah. uh, Katie Telford, about Ottawa City Councillor Catherine McKenney. Those are all very political. Some will yeah. say, yes, but you're uh, speaking out on trans issues. Is That goes too far. That goes against what the college says or allows yeah i've what got to say to those people about, oh, oh i've got some things to say about that all right the first bloody thing i'll say is that the sterilization of minors is forced sterilization you cannot obtain valid informed consent from minors for such surgery that's forced sterilization by un definition that's a crime against humanity so and i know Five European countries have already backtracked on the gender-affirming surgery front. 
and the U.S. is going to follow suit relatively quickly because of all the lawsuits. And, and the, UK, the U.K. has walked away from their number one clinic on this because of problems. Tavistock. To, to, yeah, because of problems. To, yeah, that's, to hey, that's putting it mildly. Stuff. That is for sure. It's putting it mildly. In five years, there won't be a single person who ever who will admit that they were ever in favor of this absolute butchery. I'm perfectly happy with my tweet about Elliot Page. It's going to age extremely well. And the fact that I'm on the public record as opposing this sadistic lying butchery and the criminal silence of therapists in this regard, I am 100% happy about. And if the college wants to be public about this, their support for the sterilization and butchery of minors, you let them go right ahead. We'll see how that plays out. Okay, let, let me ask you this quickly. If somebody came to you in a clinical practice and said they had gender dysmorphia, they thought they were yeah. transsexual, yeah. would you throw them out of your office, tell them you're crazy? Or, no. or, or, or would you go through a, a process with them, a process oh, that you had, now say isn't allowed under the current rules. Oh, I had lots of people in my clinical practice who had problems of that sort. I mean, everybody who comes into clinical session who's reasonably troubled has an identity problem. And what you do as a counselor is you listen. You listen to what the person has to say about why they're unhappy, about the source of their misery, about the actual expression of the misery, about what they think's wrong, about what they think might constitute an improvement. You do mutual experimentation to try to figure out what the uh, steps forward are. But you should also know as a therapist, and every therapist who isn't lying, who's credible and competent knows this, that with regards to so-called gender dysphoria, first of all, the evidence that it's a psychological epidemic is overwhelming. Everyone knows that. And second, the clinical data that was derived before this became politicized indicated that the vast majority of minors who are so-called body dysmorphic, gender dysmorphic, are gay and having a hard time coming to terms with that, and who accept their bodily status by the age of 18. So it's incumbent upon you as a therapist to take the route of minimal harm. And that's absolutely 100% true on the surgical side. So the first thing you do is you approach it with the rule of thumb, which is don't do anything drastic, right? You have a confused adolescent. It's going to take a year of listening before they even tell you the whole story, before you can find out what's going on. Your job as a therapist is never to affirm someone's identity. Your job as a therapist is to explore the identity with the person so that they come, come to a fuller realization of what that identity does and should constitute. You can't impose that. And so, uh, and I would remain, as a therapist, I always remain neutral in that regard, not because I was being moral politically, but because if you have any sense, if you're counseling someone deeply, you have to understand that you cannot interfere with their destiny. It's not your right. You have to explore with them. Yeah. But so now, now you say the college forces you. Oh, there's no doubt a decision about it. and affirm early, right? Oh, absolutely. There's it is illegal not to affirm. And that is absolute. It's the death of therapy, as far as I'm concerned. Because look, man, you can't affirm someone who's anorexic. You know, they say, Well, I think I'm fat. I feel I'm fat. You know, I'm a thin person trapped in a fat person's body, let's say. Well, you know, you're starving to death. I can't affirm that. We have to explore it and see what's going on. There's no affirmation of identity in therapy. That is, that runs completely contrary to the entire ethos of the therapeutic practice. Every psychoanalyst knows that. Humanistic psychologists, behaviorists, cognitive therapists, everyone knows that. Everyone who isn't who's the therapist who isn't decrying this legislation is remaining, is, is engaging in a quasi-criminal silence that's devastating to the profession. So I have no shame whatsoever about my opposition to this absolutely insane trans activism propaganda, murderous and criminal. So, and if the college wants to go on record for opposing that, no problem. You have one uh, big fight ahead of you, Dr. Peterson. I know you're very busy right now. Thanks for taking the time today and keep us up to date on how the uh, the fight goes in the courts. 
Yeah, well, thank you for your question, sir. And and I appreciate your interest in your and your uh, what would you call it? Pointed interrogation. Yeah. Good to talk to you. Talk again soon. You bet. You've heard from Dr. Peterson. You've heard what the court had to say. Let us know what you think. Drop a comment down below. Share this on what social media you can. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel.